bio for you guys, and then I'll um, then we can dive right in. So before you leave, when we say mental health, <laughs> I promise you it's going to be fun. Can we play that video? Conferences. Thank you so much for this. I want to share those answers with everybody. Connecting with the community live. So thank you for three years of listening. Season four of the Little Ones. Welcome to Live with Us. The most everyone will experience disability at one point within their lifetime. In the US, 40% of the population over the age of 65 do not have the necessary tools to live their daily lives on a basic level. And we're not talking about going on vacations. We're talking about going to the bathroom. It could be any one of us at any moment. I was in constant pain. My knees were always hurting me and I was at, I don't know, center of physical therapy and my pain was gone. And I was like, I wanna do that. I participated in sports many years growing up, and but I also sustained a number of injuries and realized how difficult it, it could often be to get back to uh, participating. So I grabbed my broom and we have a history of arthritis in our family and my thumbs were really sore that day. So I had some duct tape in my barn, which is good for everything. And I made this loop over my broom handle and I stuck my hand in. I was able to relax my hand and just sweep without gripping my thumb, which is always sore. What about if we put our heads together and develop a product that helps people hold on to all the tools they want to use all day long? I think a lot of times in healing others, you heal yourself. Mm. Right? Um, maybe I am wired this way. <laughs> it's, it was in in the beginning, just my goal to help one person. If I could help one person not be alone, yeah. get that child what they need to, to be mobile, get that adult, your grandparent, your loved ones, just one person, then I think it will help me to heal as well. But then, in building little ones, in building this bridge, I realized very quickly that there are more of us out there. There are more people who want to help each other. So all I have to do is make sure there's the structure in place to help the world. As a kid growing up, I experienced a lot of discrimination culturally. We made our cathedral in New York City accessible. So that's where my advocacy started. I was born with a pretty rare hip disease. It's not enough uh, blood supply went to the femoral head or the hip socket. It grew like a tomahawk and it would slip out of socket. We did a whole bunch of work and then ultimately went to the FDA, found the right person in the FDA and we got, um, they gave us approval to do personal importation of the drug to Europe. So the moment the drug became available in Europe, we were able to import it and use it. And within a week, I would be, I couldn't walk. My arms weren't working. Uh, I had gone into respiratory failure. Uh, I was on a ventilator. I couldn't speak. I couldn't even blink my eyes. Uh, they would take my eyelids closed at night so that I could sleep in two. Um, and by the beginning of October. I expect to pass this way, but only once. Any good, therefore, that I can do, or any kindness that I can show to any fellow creature, let me do it now. Let me not defer or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. I did this mission uh, in 2020 because of addiction medicine, because I was seeing people fall through the cracks because of transportation. You know, but that's, that's a fixable problem, right? So I made this RV so that we could take it to the community centers, to the homeless shelters, to the transitional houses. Whatever the population needs, that's we're what gonna we're going to do. do. That. It was about creating a solution to a problem. Tunnel vision it, and all you can see is the steps that you need to take. And, and there's nothing else. Little Wins um, is a platform, a marketplace, to facilitate the trade, or to buy or sell used medical equipment and also supplies. It really has to stop this whole concept of these people have disabilities and these people don't. And yep. like, what if we're all just people?
What if it is that simple? That simple. Major little video. Can you guys hear me? I feel like I'm far away from. Do I need to? What should I do? Is that okay? All right. Well, good morning again, everybody. I'm Lexis Surratt. I am a single working mother of four and the founder and CEO of Little Wins. Um, we are gathered here today to talk about everyone's favorite topic, uh, but it's such an important one, mental health awareness. Um, when I set out for this, when, when you lovely people asked me if I would talk about it, I wanted to run out of the room, <laughs> right? I was like, no, I, mm. why, I thought, like, why, why do I feel this way? Why? And I realized, in part, it's because I know what it means. So by definition, it is um, emotional and psychological, emotional well-being, and it affects how we think, feel, and act. It also helps determine how we manage stress, relate to others, and make healthy choices. Mental health is important at all stages of life, from childhood through adulthood, and there is no single cause for mental illness, but there are some contributing factors, and we're gonna get back to those in one second, because what made me wanna run was the way that we've kind of coined mental health. Like, it's like a hashtag now <laughs> in social media, and I think it lost a little bit of its understanding in doing so. Um, and those common contributing factors are trauma. Anybody in here experienced any trauma? <laughs> Child abuse, a sexual assault, witnessing violence, ongoing chronic mental conditions, medical conditions, and chronic pain. I mean, I got a lot of chronic pain, yep. And um, this one, I think, is, is the most important, having feelings of loneliness or isolation. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, sometimes. And I think that's okay, right? I think it's okay. But to dispel all of the misunderstandings around something that is just, uh, happening to everyone, something we all have to be aware of. No one escapes <laughs> needing to take care of their mental health and well-being. Nobody. So what we were talking about on the panel, if you missed it, I think, gosh, you guys are brilliant. But my major takeaway from that is, what if today we just look at each person we encounter with the understanding that maybe they're feeling that some of the same exact things you are? And that would be a really good jumping off point. But if you consider all of those baseline contributors to things that could affect your mental health, a recent study by Harvard Medical School based on 29 nations, it was 150,000 people, I think, um, reported that half of the world's population will experience a mental health disorder within their lifetime. Well, what if you already had chronic pain, <laughs> right? Wouldn't that ultimately be all of us? I think that's the math. But yeah, I mean, if you really think about it, yeah, we are all going to experience that because we have to work. We have to pay taxes. We have to pay our bills. You're held to a tireless, like, you are not allowed to be tired. What am I even saying? You cannot be tired. You have to answer all your emails and your voicemails and every platform and do it without saying this is hard. You cannot say this is hard. It's too much sometimes, right? It can be so overwhelming. I don't know about you guys, but that's I think my biggest, I don't even care about my joint pain anymore. I care about the fact that, well, who said it? Um, we don't go on vacations anymore. Someone said that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, but I don't go on vacations either. And I was like, oh my God, she's calling me out. Because you feel like if you do, you can't keep up. If you have children, all those messages, all the calls, all the organizing, the scheduling, and, and never saying it's too much, is 
exponentially more depending on how many you have. So I think overall what I really wanted to show and portray in, in the video I made for you, it's um, clips from, from my podcast. Uh, these incredible people who went through some really trying times and were brave enough to tell me their story and, and share it honestly and openly. Um, when I wanted to start Little Wins, I, I didn't finish college. You guys all have these like <laughs> incredible backgrounds. I, I was a bartender, a dishwasher. I was a server. I've been housekeeping <laughs> in hotels and pretty much done every job, but be a doctor. So it's, it's really humbling always to be in rooms like this, talking to people like you. Because, boy, if you told me 10 years ago I would be, I'd be like, <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> no. Uh, but just the, I don't know, I'm not going to cry, but I do really get overwhelmed with um, gratitude for, for the opportunity and the importance of the discussions are not at all lost on me. When I set out to start Little Wins, I was really intimidated by it. I had so many people in my life tell me you're not smart enough, right? You don't know how to do it. You can't do it. Well, how are you going to solve anything? And it got in my head until watching people carry their children into clinics when I'm taking my daughter to a clinic because they can't afford a wheelchair. Because they only got a 10 pack of, of that physical therapy session, but they're just so grateful to be there but their child has muscular dystrophy. They need that therapy for life. Until I just got so angry at the unfairness of it all. And I, I didn't know where to start. I actually Googled how to start a company. <laughs> it's true, it's true, it's true. Yeah, it's how it started and I'm not ashamed to say it. It's, I'm, I went to the University of YouTube and Google. It's, it's working out so far. But I, I couldn't stand myself knowing all of this is going on if I don't even try. So I talked to therapists and doctors and asked them if they would ask their patients or caregivers if they would ask the people they work with to talk to me about their experience, acquiring care and equipment. Anything they would tell me, I wanted to find the commonalities. Just like, where do you start solving the problem? Then I found that in 175, I think 75 or 76 conversations, they were really difficult because of that loneliness and isolation, fear, and, and the word ashamed came up a lot. They just didn't want to tell me what was going on, so I led with my story. I said, if you listen to me, I'll tell you everything. <laughs> and, and then when I'm done, if you could tell me anything, I, I would appreciate it. And that's the only way anyone could feel comfortable enough. And that was all right with me. But I found that people had things that they no longer needed. They needed things they couldn't get. And no matter what their socioeconomic breakdown or anything was, they all felt alone and isolated. No matter where they were. Well, that's not really going to work, right, guys? I wanted to match them, put them together, bring a community together. But I think we need to do that for all of our mental health and well-being is really level with each other, really genuinely talk to each other about don't go around saying, I'm good, how are you? Stop. Like, like no, that's just not worth it. Tell me. I don't even care if you're like, you know what, I'm having it crappy morning and I'm just going through the emotions or I'm really tired because this is really hard and sometimes it just feels so impossible. I walked in here after a hectic morning and I asked a stranger for a hug. <laughs> I thought it was like, can you hug me? Um, but she didn't touch my hair. <laughs> Full circle. I just, if I could ask everyone to do one thing, and then tell everyone you meet to do this too. 
let's simplify it. Sometimes the solutions are so simple that we're simply overlooking them. The oldest tricks in the book to ground yourself and to feel like you, you have a healthy, strong mental well-being is to kick off your shoes and your socks and walk around in grass. Just walk in the grass, feel the grass, smell the grass, stomp in the puddles, do it. I do it all the time, it's so fun. Stand in the rain, dance in the rain. Carve out time to just go for a walk and don't think about all the scheduling and all the emails and like, yikes, because I do that and I have to tell myself to stop. Look at the tree. Touch it. Touch it. Be by water. Go by a mountain. I want everyone to take a pause, even if it's just, and I know that it's hard to do. Take a deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth. We are not robots. Nobody. Feel the grass, dance in the rain, dance in your kitchen, look at the stars. Taste, smell, hear. Let's live. Let's, let's live. And it's so simple to just, even if you can't walk in the grass, because I live in Chicago and it can get snow for like ever. <laughs> ever. <laughs> look out the window, right? Yeah, yeah, oof, cold. Then look out the window. Watch for the birds. Watch the clouds blow by. And encourage your friends, your family to do the same when everyone's like, I'm going to scream. <laughs> and to take it easy on yourself, knowing that Harvard said we're all a complete mess. <laughs> like, we're all feeling these feelings. And, um, and I want to give you all a, a great big hug, you know? Thank you so much for your time and for having me here today, not just listening, but actually hearing me. I can tell that you are. And for, for also contributing in the hand up game. That was really cool. It's not easy to do. So if you have any questions, um, I think we have some time, yeah? Shoot. You don't have to run. <laughs> I, can I come down there with you? Do I have to stand up here? Yeah, yeah, I, I'd like you on. to comment on the role of spirituality in the healing process. We want to comment on the role of... No, I'd like to hear your, your comments, because I think your experience is very valuable. Spirituality. <laughs> um, in which, like, not religion, just... It can be religion. It doesn't have to be to be spiritual. Thank you. Okay, I just wanted to clarify it. You have to believe in something. You have to. It's like the grounding effect of walking barefoot in grass. You just, I don't even care what it is that you do, you know, bless you. Bless you, bless you, bless all the gods, all the things. As long as you're not hurting people, that's all I care about. So you could believe in, in whatever it is, but there has to be a belief. I believe in love. I believe that is the strongest power and force behind everything. Love something, love somebody, be open enough and vulnerable enough to, to give that. And, and hopefully they're good people and they love you too. <laughs> and, and maybe it's just love your dog, your cat, your goldfish, I don't care. I think that's spirituality to me, and that heals so much pain. Just, just love, in, in my humble opinion. In my humble opinion. Did I answer the question? It was a good answer. What's your answer? It's a great answer. My religion? No, 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 you don't have to tell me your religion if you don't want to, but, but if I asked you the same question, what would your answer be? Um, I think that there is as you said, a human need and the ability to connect to the belief in some sort of higher power uh, helps us to heal when we're hurting. Mm -hmm. 
and I know so many people who have found purpose in that way and changed their lives in positive directions mm -hmm. that it has increased my awareness of my own belief. Absolutely. Dang, he said it better. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? You have a question? Oh, five minutes. I just want to thank you for your vulnerability and for your your advocacy and and your bringing your light to to the work and to to a, a, a population and giving hope. Um, I think about in the other panel talking about high academics, right, and and folks who can sometimes almost be too rigid in that and not connect with heal and humility, which is what propels and pushes things in advocacy going forward. So. Um, and just hats off and appreciation and, and acknowledgement. I see you and appreciate you and on the work. So thank you. Thank you so much for saying. <laughs> you have a question? I should have done the whole thing. This is so much more fun down here. <laughs> I'm glad you asked for what you wanted. <laughs> so my question is about your kids. Okay, shoot. Oh, I love talk to them. Um, yeah, have you got an hour? <laughs> I get excited. We've been yes to all day yesterday. There were brilliant educators on the dais talking about what we need to do in the classroom. And I think there was some, some conversation about parenting, but not quite as much. Mm -hmm. And your, uh, I just love the call to the simplicity. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what you notice your kids are modeling because of the courage you've taken to take a stand for helping even if it's just one other person. What do you see happening in them? Yeah, I might make you cry, You're gonna Sorry. make me cry, but that's okay, I'm here to cry. Sometimes, <laughs> you, sometimes like, it's just water, right? Um, they move me. A lot, it, like sometimes I can't tell if I'm inspiring them or they inspire me or maybe it's just all, maybe that's just love, right? They are so brave and they're so uniquely different individual, all four of them, so different. But they work together really well. And when something's hard for one, they help another, and then they start to do that with other children. And it hasn't always been easy. There's some mean kids out there. Ugh, they're doing some mean stuff. Your story brought me to my knees. There's some bad stuff going on. And, and it, it was going on when we were kids. It's, it's just a little bit worse, I think, because of social media and and the, the effect of that, ugh, I know, it's gross. It's like, what, what do we do about that? Ugh. But they are s strong enough to know they can help another in any way, shape, or form. If they can, they will. And they know, I think, they understand that it, it does heal both people. It does feel good on both sides. If you can help somebody, they do. And they're just... Um, they're just really funny. Like they love to laugh and we, they're the ones that stomp in puddles with me and dance in the kitchen. And then when other children come over, if that's not what's going on at home, but they wanna join in, they encourage differences. But they also want to learn more about everyone else. I live in an area where there's not a lot of differences. That's, just <laughs> that's another story for another day. But they want to know, they want to travel and understand, and that is a different part of, of educational process too, and just sticking up for themselves and for others. What do you hear from their teachers? The same exact thing. They did this really cool thing this year, you guys. So it was my youngest first time in, in the elementary school, and then I, so I have two fourth graders, a third grader, and a kindergartner and they would go check on each other. Well, they're like, they'd take a bathroom break and go to the classrooms, and my youngest would get out an hour early and then go to like a, you know, whatever that holding pattern is <laughs> for an hour, and my, uh, one of my twins would go get her so that we could all be picked up together. And um, I just think that's really cool. Just when they know something was hard, my son had rough beginning to this year. Third and fourth grade is not easy, woof. But 
um, he, he was going through some things like we, we all do. So my one in the chair would draw him pictures and go, <laughs> and then the other ones would go visit him. And it's just such a supportive, I, I'm bragging now, but honestly, they're the coolest kids I've ever met. <laughs> they really are. I'm really proud of them. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you guys so much. I'm around all day and tomorrow if you have more questions. But more over more than anything, thank you so much for your